Hi, welcome to Revenue Marketing Television, the CMO Insight Series. I am your host, Jeff Pedowitz, President and CEO of the Pedowitz Group. Today we have as our guest, Patrick Giusti, who is Head of Sales and Marketing for the U.S. at Mad Street Dent. Patrick, welcome to the show. Yeah, hey Jeff, thanks for having me on. You bet. So I was really excited uh, to get you on. One, of course, you and I have known each other forever, done yep. some good war battles, but first person in a while that's doing both sales and marketing uh, at the same time. Uh, so what a, what a great perspective, uh, especially as we think about today's performance driven marketer. So tell us a little bit about Mad Street Den, the company, what it does, and then some, you know, what you're trying to do there running both sales and marketing for the U S. Yep. So Mad Street Den is a computer vision AI company, and we're focusing on the retail sector and we have a um, sub company called view.ai. And so it's image and video recognition software for retail and fashion. Um, so really what that means is we take video, we take images, we create metadata associated with those images so that things like onboarding of um, <clears throat> products from the time they get them onto the website is faster. We can also do things like um, process video so that video can be shoppable. So if you're looking at a video, we can extract the garments and you can actually buy those items as you're watching a video um, and a lot of other things that <clears throat> I think are really uh, changing the, the retail industry and how people buy online. And so super exciting. The company's doing great. We have a great team, great leadership. And so it, it's, I'm a couple months into it and it's super exciting. Retail is one of those industries that's undergone such a transformation. Uh, I guess yeah. it's the Amazon effect. So uh, it's very cool seeing some of the things you're doing there. So talk, tell us a little bit about now running both sales and marketing. What's that like? Yeah, so this is this is my second time <clears throat> running sales and marketing. And it's, it's interesting because I think my, as you know, my background is, you know, with companies like SAP and Oracle where, you know, there's always a pretty significant wall between sales and marketing. And sales is just, you know, you go out and sell. And so having marketing, it, it, it really gives me a much deeper appreciation for how hard it is and how hard it is to, you know, be really effective and drive leads and the cost of getting good leads and the value of getting good leads and getting a message out there. And so um, it but but on the other side of it, it helps me really understand you know, what the, the effort that it goes into to creating a good campaign and how valuable that is on the sales side when you have that messaging and that air cover, as well as, um, you know, all those good leads coming in. It's a powerful combination that, that certainly makes the selling side of it a lot easier. So I know, I know you're just getting started building out the team, but because you are running both, do you think about your work structure a little bit differently than maybe, you know, if you were just setting up a sales team, just setting up a, a marketing team, are there ways that you can drive alignment? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, I, I think alignment is, is kind of the key word because, you know, I, I always thought that in a smaller company it would be easier to have alignment between sales and marketing. But, uh, as I learned in the last couple of go arounds was that, uh, you have the same problems, right? You, 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 you want to make sure that sales and marketing are always 100% aligned and that, you know, especially with the sales team, when you get a lead that, you know, you're following up on it immediately and you have a process in place to report back on, you know, what the feedback is, what the quality of the leads are, um, you know, what type of lead it is so that marketing constantly has a, a feedback loop. And so the test and learn projects, uh, have that feedback from sales and they can they can go out and adjust and, and make improvements on the next go around. Okay. Uh, are there specific ways that you're going to hire where someone is running a shared function? Um, so you're kind of really doing sales and marketing together or are you still going to kind of have your classic different org trees but you just happen to manage both because you're going to have them both reporting to you? Yeah, I think it's, I, I think I'm going to keep them separate. That's the plan for the moment. Um, but who knows? I mean, I'll try to be as efficient as you know, in a, in a startup culture, it is, it's all about being super efficient. So, I mean, the reality is that, you know, content comes from, uh, you know, not just marketing people in a startup, it comes from product managers. It comes from the CEO, the CTO. <clears throat> so kind of by definition, everybody has a hand in not only marketing, but in sales. So, cause you're drawing on the best people and the, the best minds in the company. And we have a lot of great people that don't necessarily sit in marketing, but are great contributors. So if you look at, 
you know, who contributes to marketing. It's basically everybody or it's most people. Um, so I think from an org chart perspective, they, re they remain separate. But from the reality is, is that, that everybody's a contributor. And, you know, when we have marketing calls, there's a lot of people on those calls. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, for most of the time I've known you, it goes back a while now, probably about seven or eight years. You've worked at pretty big companies. So now you're at a startup. Um, you know, what's different? I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of things that are different, but yeah, you know, what are some of the most acute things? That's, pretty, that's a pretty long list. I mean, it's great. I mean, I love it. it, it it's... Um, I love the the being able to you know see across the the whole company and see all the parts of a company where you just you just don't have that at a company like Oracle or SAP. Um, you know, one of the things that that you know I get to do is I get to see um, you know all the leads that come in, all the campaigns that go out, and so um, you know one of the things that we're really focusing on is trying to understand what the quality of those leads leads are. So if I if I break it down at a high level. What, um, you know, let's say we get 100 leads, 40% of them are usually, you know, people that are looking for information for personal reasons, right? 30% are, you know, maybe maybe investors or, um, you know, different type of institutions that are looking for information. And you get about 30% that are your target audience, right? So it's interesting at a, at a small company being able to see all that. I can then start to think about how, you know, do we tweak the messaging to, you know, up that percentage so we get more leads and more interaction from our target customer? Or is that just the way it is? Is that, that the way it's always going to be? So we just need, instead of getting 100 leads in a month, we need to get 200, right? Um, so being, you know, the, the kind of really fun part about being at a small company is that uh, at a startup is, you know, you get to test a lot. You get to try a, a lot of different things. And you can be really surgical about the results and how you analyze the results um, because you get to see, you know, across the whole company. And so that's – it's been really fun. So you mentioned efficiency and scale a couple of times. Are there certain things that you're doing related to process or technology that will kind of help you with escape velocity? Yeah. I mean, there, there's – I would say the, the, the technology part of it is um, – I think it's kind of table stakes as you get into the startup world now. You know, you have to have marketing automation. Um, you have to be able to uh, uh, push your message out through all kinds of different channels, through you know Facebook and LinkedIn, and and so you have to use technology. But I always I always think about what it would like, what it would be like to have a startup maybe 10, 15 years ago, when you know you didn't have um, uh, you know hosting the way that we have it now. Um, you didn't have things like marketing automation the same way we have it now would have been a lot harder. Now those tools are all accessible to startups. So, you know, we take advantage of all those. And so we run email campaigns and we look at attribution and we use AdWords and we um, push our message across through all the channels and really, you know, try to test and learn and figure out, um, you know, not only what channels working, but what message works on what, what channel, which channel. And so that's kind of a constant process of, of using technology to figure out what works best. And we have to do it fast. We have to, we have, it, it can't be, you know, two, three month campaigns. This has to be, you know, week over week. We have to look at the, look at the data and say, okay, this is working and this is not working. And from a process perspective, I think, um, you know, once we get that, that, that lead or that information over to sales, we need to, we have a process where we're going to act on it really quickly. We're going to act on every lead. We're going to qualify them in a qualify them out or put them in a drip campaign or decide if we want to, you know, invest in a, in a, in a sales process, if they're the right type of customer, right type of prospect for us. So it's definitely a combination of both, both, uh, technology and, and process. Um, so you're a startup, so I'm assuming most of the effort right now is on land grab just trying to acquire as many customers as you can um yeah def definitely it's it's well there, there's really two things so i think you know there's, there's different types of startups but when you're in a startup that is somewhat creating a category you have a couple different challenges which are first you have to kind of educate people on what you're what you're proposing to them like why wh what is it so when you say things like you know computer vision and artificial intelligence and image recognition some people know what that is some people don't know what that is and maybe that person that, that is your target doesn't they're not in a technical role maybe they don't know what it is but they're interested so you have to do that education part of it 
Um, you, you, the message has to be simple. It has to be understandable enough for them to say, yeah, I want more information on this. Or, you know, I'm going to bring in some people that have been working on something similar because they need to hear this. Right. Um, so, uh, the, that's part of the focus. And then, then the second part of it is you're exactly right. It's, it's, it's customer acquisition and creating a process where, you know, we are super organized in the way that, 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 we process and leads and talk to customers. And so that the, we have really defined steps so we can get them to, Hey, I'm interested to yes, here's a proposal or no, call me back in six months or whatever, whatever the, the case may be. But I find it important to go to get through the process quickly and get to the answer. Like, Hey, is, is this a good fit or not for them? That no, makes a lot of sense. I mean, and I guess over time you'll start working on upgrade paths and and uh, with more product and more services. But right now you're just trying to get, I guess, critical mass. Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, so the, the, the other thought that uh, kind of swirls in the back of my head all the time is, you know, when you're building an infrastructure, like for, let's say customer success, right? When you have five customers, yes, you can do it. When you have 10, you know, you, you can still do it with the people you have. We're at about 25 growing to, I think, 100 in the next uh, hopefully 12 months. So we're building out a customer success team specifically to make sure that, um, you know, the customers that we do have are getting the maximum amount of attention, um, that it's really white glove treatment so that as we acquire these customers, we also, um, you know, sustain that growth through, through keeping those customers. And as we come and getting input from them and as we, as we introduce new products that, that they get the chance to look at them first and, you know, all the things that you'd want if you were, you were a customer. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So I guess shifting to more personal topics, and I mean, you've been in sales a long time now. What do you think's changed the most as a sales professional in, in the last five years? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, it, it, and I think about it a lot. I, and, and as I hire, I hire a lot of people that are, that are, you know, maybe it's their second or third job and they don't, you know, necessarily remember what it was like to, to not have a cell phone <laughs> on the, and be a salesperson or whatever. With a rotary, so, with a rotary dial, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, and so, yeah, there, there, I, I think the most significant thing, it's, it's something we talk, I think a lot about in marketing is, is that when you, when you get that first phone call, or, you know, whether you call that person or they call you or you have a lead, they're going to know a lot about you. Right. I mean, I remember at the beginning of my sales career, you know, I was a, I was a telesales rep and every once in a while they'd let me go out and do the corporate pitch. Right. So I'd do the first five minutes of me business meeting. I'd do the corporate pitch and everybody would sleep through it. And then you know, they do their the, the sales part. Of it, right. And, you know, that's the way it was. It was you went on site, you did this, you did that. Now. There's, you know, when, when, as we all know, when a customer contacts you, they've probably, you know, looked at two or three of your competitors. They know about all about you. They know what, how many, what, who, what your customers, who your customers are. And so, you know, being really prepared for that, um, you know, is key. So one of the things that we do uh, before any sales call is we do what the reverse of that would be, right? Which is, hey, if customer, you know, X is, is, um, you know, hits the website, fills out a form and we have a conversation, we need to know, you know, what is this company about? How long have they been in business? You know, what is the ownership like? Um, is there any, or is there a niche that they're going after and what are they trying to do as a company? You know, what, what is their, um, annual report or 10 K say, I mean, what, do, what, what can we find out about them? Because they know about us and we, we're, we can be pretty sure that they know about us and our competitors and who our customers are. So we need to do the same thing. And that that's, I think, probably the biggest thing um, that's changed is that access to information both ways. So we know they have it. Our customers have it. So we it's an obligation for us to know about them as well. Do you find that sale, most salespeople have that kind of patience? No, they don't. And and but it's a, it's a matter of. Um, I think institutionalizing things like that and saying, no, we, we don't, you know, get on a call unless we have what I call a call plan, which has all that information. It's just, you know, it's one page and, 
maybe a little longer and you fill it out and you have not only the information about that customer, what, what is the specific goal? You know, what are we trying to get out of this meeting? And, you know, what do we think the customer's pain points are and what are they trying to accomplish? Because if we don't hit that, then it, it, the, the message is not going to, not going to resonate with them. But yes, it takes, it, it, it takes a little bit of uh, uh, persistence to make sure that everybody, you know, is doing that. So why do you think, uh, sales as a particular profession, why so many sales professionals just kind of never hit quota or don't seem to be able to achieve. And then there always seems to be a couple at every company that you could probably air drop, drop them into a forest with a Swiss army knife and they'd be fine. You know? uh, but why, what, what do you think inhibits most salespeople from being truly successful? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. I'm not sure I have the answer for that. I, I know that there is a certain profile of person that I look for that tends to be successful. And, you know, that is, you know, it's a combination of, of, I think, you know, confidence, um, the ability to, uh, um, really think about it at less as, Hey, I'm selling this, this particular product to a per to a company as, um, Hey, you know, we have a product that's going to help them. I just need to figure out, you know, what my customer cares about. So being, you know, empathetic to, you know, what a customer is going through and really understanding what their process is. Um, and I think that is, that is kind of the new way that we have to sell. And I think it's the, the third part of it is just hard work, you know, putting in the time to, to understand what the products are and what the products do and how they help customers and knowing the case studies and being able to answer the questions. I think, you know, in a traditional model where you had salespeople's salespeople and you had solution consultants, salesperson got the meeting, you brought in a technical person and they talked about all the stuff, right? I don't think that's what our customers and prospects expect anymore. I think they expect, Hey, I'm taking time out of my day um, to talk to you. I expect you to be an expert in whatever you're talking about. And that is, I think it's the expectation. And if, if people can't do that, then I don't think they're going to get a second call. Um, it's pretty easy to get the first phone call. It's hard to get the second phone call. And you, you got to know your product. You got to know the space. You have to know your customer's industry. I think that's what separates good, good salespeople from mediocre salespeople. Well said. Good way to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's not nothing new to you, but yeah. No, but it's, it's always good hearing from a true professional like yourself. <laughs> so, uh, Pat, thanks again for being on the program. Uh, wish you all the best and continued success over at Mad Street Dent. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. It was a pleasure. Good to see you.